Today, we are picking up part two of Now Concerning Spiritual Gifts. And we are going to start here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 1, because we ended up there last week. Actually, we, we didn't end up there last week, but that's where we wanted to get to last week. And so we're going to do a little recapping without going in too much. And if you haven't seen last week's teaching, you need to see it. Now, when I say that the opposition is there, <laughs> you know, we're, we're treading in areas that is not easy to go in. And people get uncomfortable with it. And I'm, I understand that. And so as we begin to embark down this road, we saw, I've seen personally, a spirit tried to come and suppress people. And you got to shake that thing off of you folks. <laughs> you literally have to, sh to shake off the spirit of oppression because you've got the power to do so. You see, I've had to force joy and I shouldn't have to do that. But I've shared with you on a number of occasions that, you know, each day when I wake up, my prayer, my, before I even get out of bed, my declaration is this is the day Jehovah has made and I shall rejoice and be glad in it. You see, my joy doesn't come from what happens on the outside, although that may add to my joy. My joy is based on what's going on on the inside. You see, if you're in good relationship with the Almighty, that's what's most important, regardless of what's going on out on the outside. Your husband could have his bags packed sitting next to the door. Your wife, you know, you could walk in on her and find her in a compromising position. You know, there's a lot of things that can happen externally that can affect your joy. You can get an inheritance. You can get a call from a lawyer saying, you know, you just inherited millions and millions of dollars. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things that can happen externally that can affect your joy, but your joy is based on or should be based on the relationship that you have with the Almighty. The world don't give that to you. And the world should not be able to, nor should you give the world the ability to take that joy away from you. Now, that doesn't mean that you're exuberant and excited and doing cartwheels, but what it does mean is that if joy is on the inside of you, it's going to somehow manifest on the outside of you. How does joy manifest on the outside of a person? Somebody give me a way how joy manifests. A what? A smile. That's a simple, easy, low budget manifestation right there. Don't cost you absolutely nothing. You see, if joy is on the inside of you, Joy is going to come out. Your facial expression is an expression of what's going on around you or in you. You can look sad. You can look happy. You can look miserable. You can look oppressed. You can look depressed. Your physical facial expression is an indication of what's going on in you. You see. And there's times, like David says, you know, he, he, he had to actually talk to himself. I can see David standing. I don't, I don't know what kind of mirror they had back in his day, but I can see David said, bless the Lord, oh my soul. I said, bless the Lord, oh my soul. <laughs> bless the Lord, oh my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. Who is he talking to? He's not talking about you bless the Lord with your soul. He's saying bless the Lord, oh, my soul. You see, because there are going to be times, ladies and gentlemen, when things are going on in your life and the enemy knows that if he can come and steal your joy, then now you have no choice but to respond in the natural. The first thing you need to do is collect yourself, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. When the enemy and the bad reports come, bless the Lord. Bless him. Bless his holy name. Now you will not respond, but you will seek him for the proper response. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay, I'm going to have to amen myself today. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 1. 
And that's all right. I, I preach to me. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Last week we discussed that there were three areas, and we're going to look at this, that Paul is addressing. And based on these three areas that Paul is addressing, we know that something has come to him that he's now responding to. Verse 2. You know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. We discussed last week and discovered that Paul wrote this letter from Ephesus. We also note that it is his second letter, even though it is called 1 Corinthians. And we know this based on what is written in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians as he talks about now concerning those things that I wrote to you about. I told you not to keep company with fornicators. Now he goes on in this second letter called 1 Corinthians to expound that we are not to even eat with someone who called themselves a brother who be in fornication. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. When you associate with people as brothers and sisters, you now become influenced by their behavior. And even though you don't enter into fornication, you can be in somewhat agreement or acquiescence to their lifestyle simply by sitting at the table and sharing a meal. You see, one of the four pillars of a biblical congregation is fellowship and breaking bread. If you are breaking bread and fellowshipping with someone, you are operating in a supernatural capacity. The other is the apostles' teachings and prayer. You see, now if you're breaking bread and there's prayer and the word is in the midst of you, then that's one thing. But if you're ha 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 and, and laughing with someone and you're eating a meal with them and, and, and their girlfriend and you know that they're living a lifestyle that is not approved by the Almighty, you might as well be sitting there with two homosexuals or two whatever. Because heterosexuals fornicating is no different than a man and another man having relationship or woman and another woman having a relationship because it is all viewed as abominable in the sight of Jehovah. Amen. I know people want to push homosexuality in a corner, but let me tell you something, it's in the same boat. And how dare someone despise the alternative lifestyle of individuals who choose a lifestyle while accepting a lifestyle that the father doesn't approve? See, that's, that's, that's how we get desensitized through fellowshipping with the world. You have to set yourself apart. You have to come out from among them and be you separate if you expect the power of the Almighty to begin to flow in your life the way he desires for that to flow. You are an ambassador. You are a representative of, of him. And you can't never forget that. I don't care if you're with your mama, with your daddy, with your uncle, your auntie, your brother, your cousin them. <coughs> you understand what I'm saying? Paul had received information from several sources concerning the conditions existing in the congregation at Corinth. I've been in some of these congregations. You know, the, the organist, homosexual, the choir director, lesbian, the pastor, bisexuals. I mean, it's just all kinds of immoral, abominable things happening in the so-called congregations of God. People living lifestyles that is not approved. But let me tell you something. If, if, if you can successfully remove the law 
out of the picture, now you make up your own rules. It's love, brother. You just have to love people. Yes, I can love people. Jehovah loved people so much that he gave his only son to sacrifice for them. Can you love somebody that, that much? That's the love of Jehovah. And he's saying, listen, our role is to go forth and preach repentance. We're to preach repentance for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You are no longer held in contempt by the almighty, but you need to come out of that lifestyle that it brought you in contempt with the almighty. Otherwise, you're going to face the wrath of the almighty that is laid up for the children of disobedience. Some members of the household of Chloe had informed Paul of factions that had developed in the congregation. 1 Corinthians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Yeshua Messiah through the will of and Sosthenes, our brother. And we found out that Sosthenes was a ruler of the synagogue who had converted. In Acts, we found that he was beaten, probably because of that. Unto the congregation of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Messiah Yeshua, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Yeshua Messiah, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Yeshua Messiah. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Yeshua Messiah that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance, in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Messiah was confirmed in you. And this is the verse. So that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Yeshua Messiah. You see, the father doesn't want any of his people to come behind in no gift. And basically what he's saying is that the Corinthians had the gifts in operation. They had the gifts in operation, but there was so much immorality in operation in the mix of the gifts of the spirit that now people got confused. This is what happens when you mix. Whenever you allow a mixture, Jehovah has had a problem with mixture from the beginning. He don't even want us mixing two seed together. He don't even want us mixing linen and, and wool together. He don't want us mixing, you know, relationships with people that are not of our faith. He didn't want his people mixing with those who were worshiping idols. Whenever you allow a mixture in the midst of you, it begins to water down the truth. And now the truth becomes subjective. Well, you know, we, we really don't have to do that. You know, it's, and, then, and then this crazy doctrine came in to where, you know, as Gentiles, we're not under the law. We're under grace. We don't have to do the law like the Jews. That's for the Jews. The moment the mixture comes in and the removal of the Torah, people are left to their own devices to build their kingdoms, thus their denominations, thus their congregations, independently of anybody and everybody else, and they're all supposedly based on this book. Corinth contained at least 12 temples we recognize. Whether they were all in use during Paul's time is not known for certain, but one of the most infamous was the temple dedicated to Aphrodite, the goddess of love. And so we're going to find that as Paul is addressing this, what's going on in the midst of them, that he commits three chapters, chapter 12, chapter 13, and chapter 14 on spiritual gifts. And in the midst of chapter 12 and chapter 14, he builds the operation on these gifts in the combination of having the love of God 
and making sure that the love of God was not confused with the love of the world. Because now the world used terms that seem like love. As we discussed last week, what in the devil is making love? How do you make love? But that term is synonymous with sex. Why is he dealing with this issue of sex? Because Aphrodite is in town. You see, he doesn't write to the Galatians about love. As a matter of fact, the Galatians, more than likely, we don't know if they even seen this letter. We all see it, and we assume Paul wrote a separate letter to the Galatians, addressing issues that he didn't address in the Corinthians because they had a whole nother set of issues going on over there. <laughs> Some of them were similar, but not all of them were there. Aphrodite was a goddess of love whose worshipers practiced religious prostitution. About a short distance north of the theater stood the temple of Aclepius, the god of healing. And in the middle of the city, the 6th century BC temple of Apollo was located. In addition, the Jews had established a synagogue. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, Paul addresses and I bring out this 1 Corinthians chapter 7 because he clearly indicates to us that they had written a letter to him. Where is that letter? Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me. And so we now have to try to figure out why is Paul writing this? Because we don't have the letter that they wrote unto him, but we know that there are at least three things that was in the letter based on the three things that he addressed. At least three. Now concerning the things you wrote of me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So here we deal with this issue of sex. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about sex and the relationship of sex that the Almighty had established, and it's related to a man and a woman being married. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, he puts it right out there. Why is he dealing with them about fornication? Because fornication is a religion. I've told people this, the only time two people become one in the natural is when you are sexually engaged. That is an act of spirituality that is now casual sex. When you engage sexually, the two becomes one. And when you disengage and you separate, a part of you is left with that other person, a part of them is left with you, and now you're comparing every sexual encounter you have from that moment on to that. And the more you have, the more confused you become. Because the author of confusion is the enemy, and sex is one of the ways when people cross over from the natural relationship that the Almighty established between a man and a woman, and a woman and a woman and a man and a man, that is the ultimate confusion. Now you've got confusion on the, on the, the cusp and in the depth of idolatry because this abominable, ungodly behavior is trying to be pushed on the rest of, of society, even the people of God. The ultimate. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. This mess was around before the flood. 
It's not new. It's just repackaged. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, and then Paul says something here that lets us know that women have some authority. Let every man have his own wife and let every, hus every woman have her own husband. Let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. He goes even further to say, listen, husband, when you have a wife, your body is not yours alone anymore. It belongs to her. And wife, when you have a husband, your body is not just yours anymore. It belongs to him. So honor God with it. Don't get in adultery. Don't lust after other people's husbands and covet somebody else's husband or somebody else's wife. Let everybody have their own. Paul here is preaching Torah. <laughs> Now, in eight, chapter 8, he deals with an issue here in chapter 8, verse 1, and throughout the entire chapter that he picks up on in chapter 12. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. What he does here is he's distinguishing, and he's going to go into depth in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, distinguishing the knowledge which is the spirit, the gift of the spirit, and the knowledge that is of the world. James is going to touch on the wisdom that is from above and the wisdom that is of the world. Just as you have knowledge of the world, and people say, you know, knowledge is power. What kind of power is it? It's worldly power. All knowledge is going to do in the world is give you a big head, puffy head. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. Because this knowledge that comes from the Almighty gives us a depth and insight that the world has no knowledge of. Paul already explained that in chapter 2 when he says, there is the natural minded man who do not comprehend the things of Jehovah. They are what? Foolishness. You see, every word in every chapter of Paul, you can't take chapter 12 away from the rest of the, the book of 1 Corinthians because you're going to miss some. You can't take a few verses out of there and start arguing on a few verses without looking at the context of the entire letter. 1 Corinthians is not a book. 1 Corinthians is a letter. You understand? A letter with paragraphs <laughs> and subject matters and transitions of subject matters. And Paul does it well. Because just as he said in chapter 7, now concerning. What did he say? Things wherever you wrote to me. The first thing is that we need to have an understanding of this thing called sex because we're surrounded by it and the religious systems of our day seem to not make a distinction because it is a way of worship. Not only is it a way of worship, as we went into depth last week, they had offerings and sacrifices that was associated with the worship in the temple of Aphrodite and the temple of Aclepius, and this is where now, once a sacrifice has been made, you got the, the remains of that sacrifice, which is meat or animals that was sacrificed to an idol, but the entire, it may have been a heart that was taken out of it, or a kidney, or whatever, the brain. It could have been a part of that animal that was used in a sacrifice to an idol, and because the whole animal wasn't used, now that animal is put on the market. And people are going to the temple to buy their meat. Or they're going into the temple to enjoy the feast. They're celebrating a feast in the temple. 
of Aphrodite's, eating before Aphrodite herself. You can imagine individuals who had problems getting children or who had problems having, now they got another Aphrodite, Aphrodisiacs. The blue pill. So you got people who are going to the temple for worship. And part of their worship was taking off their clothes. And if folks had problems with certain anatomy, anatomy <laughs> they would probably have to pray to the, to the goddess to heal them. And part of the worship in these temples was having demons manifest themselves and speak to the priests to instruct the congregants. Now you got folks who are in some kind of trance giving in to spirits and prophesying. So Paul has to clear up all of this mess and he does this very eloquently in chapter 12 and then even more so in 13 and 14 so that people understand spiritual things and how they're supposed to operate and distinguish them from how they're not supposed to operate. That's the purpose of the letter. Now it's touching things offered unto idols. We know that we have, that we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. Verse number three. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols. We know that an idol is what? Nothing. And in the world is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. Now as Paul is dealing with the Corinthians, if you remember in the book of Acts, in Athens they had statues of all of their deities and they even had a statue to an unknown God. And so what I need you to see here is that the Corinthians were very religious people and they practiced the worship of their gods. A person could leave the temple of Aphrodite's and go to the temple of Apollos. And they could leave the temple of Apollos and go over to Asclepius. They can go from temple to temple because it really didn't, didn't, didn't really, the only, the only, the only people, listen to me ladies and gentlemen, the only people that were not permitted to do this, the only people on the earth that was not permitted to do this was Jehovah's people. Jehovah's people only have one. He says, listen, don't bow down to those idols. Now imagine being brought up in a place like this where you have churches on every corner. <laughs> I would call it like it is. And all of these so-called churches are preaching from this book. And many of them have come to the conclusion that we don't have to do the big part of the book, the beginning. Yes, just, just rip that out, brother. We ain't under that stuff no more. Oh, no. Mm. And then there are some who pick and choose what part of the book they want to take. Oh, we'll take some of this, mm-hmm, like they're at the grocery store. Oh, no, we don't want any of that. We tried that, and it doesn't work for us. It don't taste good. Oh, uh, yeah, I think I like this. Oh, man, that, that looks good. And y you know what I'm saying? You can't pick and choose the book. An idol is nothing. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, and notice what he says, in verse 5 of 1 Corinthians, as there be gods many and lords many, 
we know that Jehovah recognized the fact that there are many Elohims. He said to his people, you shall not bow down to them. You shall not worship idols. You shall have no other gods. How can I have an other God before my God if there was no other gods? So he acknowledged the fact that there are people who worship deities other than him. They worship the sun, Sunday. You see, they worship moon, animals. He says, listen, people will find something to worship. They'll find something that creeps on the ground to worship. They'll find something that swims in the, in the water to worship. They'll find something that fly to worship. They'll find something in the heavens and worship. But you, you're not to worship and bow down to anything on the earth, anything in the water, anything in the air, anything in the heavens, for you only have one Elohim and him only should you worship. So don't worship me like that. And so Paul says, yeah, there are many. And then in chapter 12, he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols. What dumb idols? See, for you to read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and not know the idols that the Corinthian people were worshiping, you won't under understand the context and why Paul is addressing certain issues because in Corinth, they had certain issues with certain idols. And these idols were prominent in the lives of the community. See, you, walk, you can drive all around the city of Charlotte. You might see a mosque. You'd have to go out on Johnston Road, to the only one that I know of. There may be others. I've not seen them. You, you may find um, a, a Buddha. I mean, you go to some of these restaurants, you'll see Buddha. You go to some of these Indian restaurants and you'll see Krishna. And all of the many Krishnas, the Lord this and the, the Lord that and the woman with 20 hands, man with the elephant head, you'll find them all. But you don't see their temples. Why? Because they know that in this particular country, for them to put their temple outside their facility would cause an uproar within community. Imagine driving down the street and seeing a Buddhist temple with a statue of Buddha outside. Or driving down the street and seeing a Hindu temple with a goddess with all of the different arms prominently displayed like you find in the Catholic churches with all of their Statues. There would be an uproar. But you go to China and, and you go to India, this stuff is exposed and they have feasts and festivals and pilgrimages. But we're so isolated and alienated from that until immigrants from those countries come to the United States and bring their worship. And though they have their home right next to you, you don't see that in the basement they've got a temple right next door to you. You just don't see it. All you see is their little idols when you go into their shops. But this is happening all around us. And pretty soon, with the way our government is trying to press and force 
desensitizing the religious community and acceptance of all types of immoral and, and irreverent and abominable practices. And the target is our young people and the school systems. And I'm watching this stuff going on and some of it creeping up into my own house. Children don't want anything to do with the Bible, don't want to read the Bible, don't want to pray. And they don't even realize that they're being desensitized by the world around them so that they don't pray, they don't talk to God, and they're left with their own imagination to figure things out for themselves because they reject the religion of their parents. It's happening right here. And pretty soon, 20 years from now, a idol of Buddha and Krishna will be commonplace on neighborhoods because people are going to be so desensitized to where everything is acceptable. That's what's happening. Wickedness increasing. It's prophesied. It's going to increase. It's going to get so bad that before the day of Messiah comes that the elect, if those days aren't shortened, will be caught up in that deception. They'll be fooled. The people who, people like me, people like you. We're the elect, folks. That's what he's talking about. If those days weren't shortened, how in the world can you and I Give in to that to where the Father has to shorten the days. I'll tell you how. Because we're surrounded by people that we love. And in order to accept the people that we love, we've got to accept their nonsense. Unless you put your foot down, says, no, that nonsense is not coming in my house. You want to live that kind of way, you'll live that kind of way, but I have nothing to do with you. And let me tell you something. There are only two people on the planet that have that mentality. Muslims and Jews. Only two. The Christians, and the Messianics, oh, we accept you. Come as you are. Stay as you are. We're just going to love you, brother. We're going to love you into the kingdom. And I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the plan is working. The plan is working. We live in a society now that 20 years old and under, many of them, I, I dare say 99.9% .9 of 20 years and under have never picked up a Bible. Now, I know that's pushing it, and there's no way in the world I can prove it. I just look at the lifestyle. So all I have to look at is the lifestyle. I know in my own house, and I'm a religious man, if I don't make people pick up the Bible, very few of them will. Look at your house. How many times you caught your son, your daughter, reading the Bible? Your grandchild reading the Bible on their own. It's already happening. And if they don't do it and they raise children, guess what? You think they'll do it? Two generations from now, America is going to be a pure cesspool and it's already a cesspool right now. And it's not just America because America is taking this democratic behavior and mindset and trying to force it on the world. Well, you don't like America, get out and go where? Where am I going to go? You think I can escape this Babylon by going to another? This is the best Babylon. <laughs> I ain't fool. No, my mama didn't raise no fool. 
I'll go to the mother Babylon, but I bet I, I, I'm going to make sure my passport is valid before I leave. <laughs> so I can come back. You know what I'm saying? I've been to some of those places. You know what I'm talking about? We, we got the best Babylonian system on the planet right now. And the other worlds are, are trying to catch up. Sad, isn't it? Folks trying to be like America. So he says, I know you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols. What dumb idols? And he uses the word dumb. It, it's like idols don't stand by themselves. He says these dumb idols, and the word he uses there is a Greek word that actually refers to mute. It's a mute. He can't speak. Now, notice the language. He says, you were carried away. You know. Now, you know those of you who have come out, you know that you were carried away, carried away, led, driven, taken unto these dumb idols, dumb idols, something that can't speak. So how do you get led by an idol that can't speak? I'll tell you how, just like you get led by religion. You see, every religion has its spokesperson. <laughs> every one of them. The Baptists got their spokesperson. The Catholics got their spokesperson. The Imams got their, the mosque got their spokesperson. The Hindu temple got their spokesperson. You can call them, you can call them Imam. You can call them priests. You can call them rabbi. You can call them reverend. You can call them what you want to. But when people need to make a decision, they don't call on the Almighty. They call on his representative, and his representatives go before their idol and do whatever ritual they do to get a word from their idol and then come back and give them the word to his people. And the people, out of obedience to their religion, do what their priest, their pastor, their reverend, their imam, their rabbi says because they want to be in good standing. Even if it means blowing up, put a, strapping a bomb and walking into the middle of a crowd of people and setting the thing off. even as you were led. Now concerning the collection. So now they have another issue. We got issues here that are dealing with sex and relationship. We got issues here that are dealing with idols and worship. We got issues here that are dealing with the supernatural. And we got issues here in Corinth that is dealing with money and collection. They're writing to Paul concerning the things you wrote to me about. And Paul is systematically in chapter 7, he deals with the marriage issue and the relationship sexually. In chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11, he deals with the issues of idols. In chapters 12, 13, and 14, he deals with the issues of supernatural gifts or supernatural manifestations. In chapter 15, he deals with the issue of the resurrection, what happens to the dead. And in chapter 16, he deals with the issue of collections, which indicates to us that at least those things was in the letter that they wrote to Paul. So we can get an idea, although we don't have the letter and the wording of it. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, it's very difficult to come away with a conclusive conclusion when you only got part of the information. So now we have to rely on the tools of interpretation to get as close as we possibly can. That doesn't bring to question Paul's writings. We're just trying to be good 
students of the word so that we don't walk away with the wrong conclusion like centuries and millennium of people have before us. We live in a society right now, ladies and gentlemen, that those of you who keep the commandments, now notice, there are people who keep the commandments and they have absolutely nothing to do with the New Testament. There are people who do the New Testament and they have absolutely nothing to do with the Old Testament. There are people who keep the Sabbath and they reject the rest of the law. There are people who, you know, they just bunch it all together. And so you got all of these individuals that are taking their, their piece, their portion of it, and we as messianics, as people who try to live a Torah-centered life and who believe in the testimony of Yeshua, We are less than 1% of the world's population. So over 99% of the population that we live in the midst of us, that we live in the midst of, totally disagree with your assessment of this book. And you wonder why people don't like you. You wonder why people turn on you. You wonder why people treat you the way you, they treat you. You know why? You're not just a minority. You are a super minority. And I'm not talking about color. I'm talking about belief. We are the minorities. <laughs> the minorities. We are the minorities minority on the planet. That'll be in Webster in a couple of years. Just like ain't is. You know what? I was really, let me get to this because although all of these subjects are worthy, we got to deal with this issue of, of spiritual gifts. Corinth was plagued with several issues Paul addressed. Although the congregation was spiritually gifted, it struggled with immaturity, instability, divisions, jealousy. It dealt with envy, lawsuits among brethren, marital difficulties, sexual immorality, and the misuse of spiritual gifts. Now, some gifts are easy to explain. Some aren't. If, you know, pretty much every man know what to do with a tie. How many of you men ever received a tie as a gift? I know if you didn't receive a tie as a gift, you probably bought your own tie. And if you're a man and don't have a tie, what kind of man are you? No, just kidding. <laughs> as a man who has not been, you know, part of that, 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 this whole, this system. Now, most of you have a pair of shoes, right? Now, if you don't have a pair of shoes, then you are third world for real. So if somebody give you a pair of shoes, you don't have to figure out what to do with them. Now, you might have to ask somebody to help you tie a tie. And if you're a child, you may have to ask somebody to help you tie your shoes. But the gift of a pair of shoes is self-explanatory. Washer and dryers. And sometimes we get gifts that we don't know what to do with or how to use them. Some gifts are not self-explanatory. So they sit on a shelf until somebody comes along and asks you about that thing you got there. <laughs> now, I, I, I started coming, words just started formulating in my head. And it's like, have you ever heard of a whatchamacallit? I went to look up a whatchamacallit. Do you know whatchamacallit is in the dictionary? Really, it is. A whatchamacallit is a thing that you call something you don't know the name to it. So what you call it? What about a thingamajig? You ever heard of th thingamajig or doohickey? Now you don't know what to do with the what you call it. You don't even know what to call it. You know, hand me that thingamajig over there. Thingamajig. 
When you begin to deal with spiritual gifts, Paul is saying, listen, you have some whatchamacallits, some thingamajigs, some doohickeys that I don't want you to be ignorant of. I'm just putting that in plain ebonics. See, you, you, when you begin to talk about, because see, if you don't know the purpose of a thing, you will abuse it. I was at the post office yesterday and the guy said to me, you know what? Because for some reason, my, my fob on my keychain, as I'm standing there, the things just, just come apart and fall. The fob falls, the battery falls out of it. I get it and I say, you know, I need some tape because this is the second time this has happened and I don't want that thing to happen because otherwise I can't open my, my truck with that. I have to use my key. And he says, you know, what I do is this guy just got in the conversation. He says, you know, um, get you some duct tape and cut around it. You know, we're having this conversation while we're waiting in the line at the post office. Then he says, you know, I'm a, one of those people who like to deal with gadgets. And, you know, there's two things that I have, you know, especially when I deal with cell phones. Cell phones don't know I'm a chief of gadget. And he says, you know, I have a hammer. And I'm thinking a hammer and a cell phone. Now, what are you going to do with a hammer besides get frustrated and smash the thing? But the point is, is that there are people who have certain things, and he says, I'm, I'm a master at a hammer, even when it comes down to my cell phone. I'm think, thinking to myself. Now, the point is, is that when you begin to master certain things, then a person could possibly, if I had a hammer, trying to work on my cell phone, I guarantee you it probably won't work when I'm done. But I remember having a car that had a bad starter. And somebody told me that if you got a car that's got a bad starter, take a hammer, slide under it, and tap the starter, and guess what? I did that a few times, the thing worked. It's like the starter is stuck. The hammer on the starter, you know, it, so, so now I know what to do with, with a hammer as it relates to a starter. There are certain things that you can take a hammer with and drive a nail. You can take a hammer and, and, and tap something gently. But you know you can be very destructive with a hammer. Putting certain things in a child's hand. I mean, a gun is, a, is, is, is something that if you understand how to use it, and when to use it, it is something that can be of an aid to you. It can provide protection to some degree, or it can ward off people who want to harm you. But you don't put a gun in the hand of a baby, especially a loaded one. You follow what I'm saying? Now imagine someone having abilities and they don't know how to use them. Imagine that Jehovah says to Adam and Mrs. Mrs. Adam, he says, listen, all the trees in the garden you may freely eat except that one. The day you eat of that one, you're going to die. Really? Instructions. But what happened? They disobeyed the instruction. You see, if you don't understand something, there's a good chance that you will misuse it and it would be to your own destruction. In the Corinthian community, they were manifesting gifts, but in the process of manifesting these gifts, they were mixing it probably with some of their other practices. Like one right now, in some of the Pentecostal circles, there's a term called Kondalini. And Kondalini is a Hindu art of putting a hand on a particular part of one's forehead and causing them to fall backwards. So they got catchers, catching people falling backwards, operating in an art in the house of God that is confused by the people as being the work of the Holy Spirit operating 
when it's a Hindu practice. And some people decide that we know how to get people fall, to fall out. I got a meeting coming up in about mm, two months. Not going to brush my teeth or floss for two months. All right, those of you who need healing, come. I was just kidding, folks. Just trying to add a little humor here, but you, you get the point. Paul says, listen, it is easy to be ignorant when it comes down to the, the spiritual things, and I don't want you to be ignorant. The word he deals with here as it relates to spiritual is a Greek word, pneumatikos. It is from the word breath. It is from spirit, pneuma. That is the breath. You see, when a person breathes their last, they give up the spirit. Giving up the spirit means you just had your last breath. Now you are dead. Non-carnal, ethereal, as opposed to gross, demoniacally, there are demon spirits. A spirit is what it is. One of the issues Paul was asked about was the spiritual. And he writes, you know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols as you were led. Before Paul gets into explaining how the supernatural works, he wants them to understand how it doesn't work and the danger of mixing that which is not from the Almighty with that which is. Images that could speak or could not speak, Paul speaks about these in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And if you read chapter 8 verses 1 through 13, you'll see in detail how he deals with it. Paul most likely had issue with people mixing the faith in Jehovah with idolatry. But he's not the only one because there was a big issue now that none, none Hebrew people are coming into a faith that has been Hebrew since his exception, how do we deal with these individuals who are not familiar with the Torah? How do we deal with these individuals who are familiar with their religious systems but are not familiar with the scriptures handed down by the Almighty through Moses and the prophets and the writings? How do you deal with folks who are coming off the street, they've never heard the gospel, the true gospel. All they've been exposed to is television evangelists. How do you deal with people who've been to that church and to that church? And I'm dealing with people who have been Buddhists and they've been Muslims and, and, and they've been in witchcraft and they've been in Pentecostalism, and they've been in Baptist, and, and, and they've been in Seventh-day Adventists, and Jehovah's Witnesses, and they've been in all kinds of stuff. How do you deal with this? And see, we look at a person as he's just or she's just a person, but this person has a path or past. They have a history. And in this history, for you to get where you are today, you've got a path that you have come. You have information that you've picked up along the way. And this information, this knowledge, this doctrine, this understanding, and then you've mixed it in to figure it out how it works for you and what you are going to believe and what you are not going to believe. And then you get in conversations with these people who already got their mind made up, who are simply trying to trap you in your belief system and trying to expose a weakness in your frame of reference and your thought, just like they did Yeshua. And so Paul has got these people who are coming in to the faith and they don't know and they're operating. And he's got to bring order. 
and he deals with this issue of order. He says, listen, yes, that should be operating. Yes, that should be operating. Yes, there should be prophecy, tongues, and interpretation. And yes, there, these things should be done. But there's an order. And if you don't do things in order, it's going to be confusing. And he gives specific examples as it relates to tongues. We'll get to that later. But there was mixing because you can't help but mix. Every one of you came here from somewhere. You got your own idea of how church is supposed to be. What's the gospel? What should be taught and what shouldn't be taught? And the moment you hear something that goes against what you already believe, flags go up in your spirit. The Jerusalem Council had the same issue. So they gathered and people have mixed that up so bad, which is why I did a teaching on the first Jerusalem Council. What do we do with those Gentiles? To, to understand that this is not about circumcision, as people want to argue, it's about a person having to become a Jew before they can become, as the church say, a Christian. Now... The flip, the script has been flipped. Before a Jew can come to, to, to be saved, they have to become a Christian. You see how the flip, the script has been flipped? The only way, and this is what the church teaches, the only way a Jew can, can be saved is they accept Jesus Christ. They have to accept Jesus Christ. And before Christ, as the Christian church says it, before a Gentile can be saved, they had to convert to Judaism. They had to convert. They had to be circumcised. So now the argument comes up in 1 Corinthians 15 that, listen, you people need to understand this is not about conversion. It's not about being, becoming something through some physical act of circumcision according to Moses who didn't even have a doctrine on circumcision. He just simply said the person had to be circumcised. It was actually Abraham. And this was a doctrine that was perpetuated by the Pharisees. If you read the text in 1 Corinthians 15, those among the Pharisees, it was a Pharisee doctrine wasn't a Jewish doctrine. It was a Pharisee doctrine because the Sadducees didn't even agree with the Pharisees on, a, on many areas, but it was specifically Pharisees here. So what did they say? What are we going to do with these Gentiles? They're coming in. They're coming out of their temples. They're coming out of their idol worships. They're coming out of all kinds of idolatry. And they are bringing their practices with them. So what did they write? Verse 20, Acts chapter 15, but that we write unto them that they do what? Abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication. Why would they have to address the non-Hebrew about fornication? Because fornication is a practice of the world. The world don't think nothing about fornication. In the military, a, a recruit, a person who is not an officer, who has a wife and commits adultery on that wife, will probably not be court-martialed. An officer of any military branch who commits adultery will be court-martialed. Why? Because it's unbecoming of an officer. There was a situation just a couple of, uh, what, a few months ago, a year or so ago, about a General Petraeus.
removed from duty. Why? Because of adultery. That's the gist of it. Fornication is acceptable in our world. Adultery is pretty much acceptable in our world. And when people come in the houses of God and they've been in adultery and they've been in fornication, even if they're having adultery and fornication today, they're not removed from the congregation. Why? Because it's a worldly acceptable practice. A pastor can commit fornication and adultery or adultery on his wife and get up and cry like a baby. Oh, I'm sick. Oh, pastor, we understand. We all human. Y'all, come on, let's pray for the pastor. Now, you need to set that joker down or you need to get your butt out of there. That's what you need to do. You don't pray for the pastor. You set the pastor down. But he founded the church. <laughs> See? And, 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 and what, what part of do not eat with fornicators do you not understand? What part of fornicators, adulterers, whoremongers, all of these individuals will have no place? How can you follow somebody, the Bible says, have no place in the kingdom if they do such things? Where do you think they're going to lead you to the same place they're going? Abstain from pollution of idols. What's the pollution of idols? And from fornication. And from things strangled. And from blood. Why is it that they have to write these things that the modern day church don't have a clue what these things are? Pollution of idols. This New Testament, ladies and gentlemen. What are things strangled? Verse 15, or chapter 15, verse 29. They wrote and said that you abstain from meats offered to idols. This is what Paul is addressing in 1 Corinthians. People... Meats offered to idols. Meats offered to idols are meats that are sacrificed in a temple that is not the temple of Jehovah, which is an indication that these temples existed. Listen, there was only one temple Jehovah established, and it was in Jerusalem. There was no other temple for Jehovah anywhere in the world, only one. His people had to come up to it. Other religions had temples in major cities, had temples all over the place. Jehovah only had one. The people had to go to it. In Corinthians, in Corinth, in Galatia, in all of these places that Paul is writing to in Rome, temples were all over and people frequent those temples. And now the preaching of the true gospel come to that city and people hear it and they resonate. It resonates with them. They want to know more. And when they begin to inquire of more, now they're looking at coming away from their family and their friends, and people who were in those temples. Guess what? The people in those temples begin to address their friends and family members who, hey, you know, that's just another God. We all worship gods. Come on. Why you got to get all monolistic? You, you, you hear what I'm saying? Why, why you got to, you can worship him too. No, I can't just worship him. And I mean, I can't worship him and worship all of them because his word says I'm not to worship any other God. I don't believe it was in the holy book of Aphrodite that you couldn't go to the temple of Apollos. But in the Torah, it says that you have nothing to do with those idols. 
Now all of a sudden, you got outrage from family members who you have set at feast with in the temple of Aphrodite, in the temple of Ecclesiastes, in the temple of Apollos, and any other temple. And now all of a sudden, what do you mean you can't go to the feast? What is this savage stuff? What are you talking about a new moon and festivals? We have festivals. What's this new moon? We don't have new moon festivals. What festival is that? So now Paul has to write them and says, don't let those idol worshipers judge you. But the Christians want to turn that and say, hey, don't let those messianics judge you because you don't keep the Sabbath, because you don't keep the feast, because you don't observe the new moon. That's not what Paul was writing. Paul was writing to believers who were keeping the Sabbath, keeping the feast, and observing new moon, saying, don't let those people judge you. You see, people are good at flipping the script. Now we got to, why do I have to defend the Sabbath? It's in the book. I had a, a, a man call me last week. He says, I'll give you a big offering if you can show me in the Bible where the Christian church have to keep the Sabbath. I just sent him a copy of my book. I don't get into arguments. You see, He's, oh, he said, I'm 90, 92 years old. I've been in the ministry 60 years. And I've not found a pastor yet who can explain to me why. And then he started going off on his tangents that I'm so familiar with. And it's like, I wouldn't even dare give this man five minutes because his mind is so made up. And then he said, most, are you still there? Now he's talking to an answer machine. Are you still there? Because by this time, most pastors hang up. Hello? Hello? Man, you haven't been talking to nobody. Now, if you're going to have a conversation with an answer machine like that, imagine what kind of conversation you're going to have with me. (laughs) You can't hear. You don't have ears to hear. And eventually I'll have to do like that answer machine. Click. My folks used to say, ain't no fool like an old fool. Now I didn't say that, they said it. He says, abstain from blood, things strangled. Meats offered to idols from blood, from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well, fare you well. The Christian church really don't understand this. Now, the Jewish community understands this well. And guess what? The Islamic community understands this well. That's why they have their halal. That's why the Jews have their kosher. And so they have to be inspected and approved by their representatives for a true Muslim or for a true Jew to eat it. If it doesn't have the stamp of the rabbi's approval, Jews who are in orthodox religion will not eat it. Why? Because it's unclean. The average person around us They go anywhere in this city and eat almost at any restaurant as long as it tastes good and don't have a clue sometimes to what they're eating. Because we're not trained to think about food on that level. We don't even really understand the importance of the things that the Almighty created to sustain our body so that our body can function the way the Almighty created it to function so that it can actually repair itself and we don't have to go to those sorcerers called doctors because we put all kinds of toxins in our bodies and now we're all clogged up and constipated. And growths, things growing out of us. 
What's that? I don't know. Better go get that check. I ain't going to get that check. They might tell me I got cancer. Don't you want to know if you got cancer? Not really. Because then they're going to tell me I can't have my poke. I got to stop eating this and I got to stop. The, well, if it's bad for you, why wouldn't you stop eating it? Because I like it. So you like it enough to where you will, I'll eat it till I'm dead. I had a conversation with some ignorant preachers. Pastor, one of my former disciples, I taking his wife out to eat. And he talking about ribs and, and catfish. And I posted and said, brother, if you love your wife, you wouldn't feed her that junk. A former seven day Adventist. Should know better. And then his pastor friends got on it. He said, hey, boy, I'm coming down there, and when I'm done, there's not going to be a pig in the whole state because we're going to eat all of them. <laughs> you see, the, and, and the, these, these are supposedly. Prominent young preachers bragging on how much swine they can dine. Say, so if you do the, if you keep yourselves things offered to idols, blood, things strangled, fornication, from which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well, fare you well. As touching the Gentiles, which believe, chapter 21, 25, it's all through Acts. We have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. Three places in the book of Acts, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Yeshua a curse and that no man can say that Yeshua is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now why would Paul write this? You see, you need to read, when you read the Bible, you need to ask questions. Why is Paul writing this? Wherefore, and, and, and he, he writes in verse 1, verse 1 and verse 2, some interesting things that he's already explained in chapter 1 up to chapter 12. So the, the writer, the reader of what Paul is writing, of those who Paul is writing to, they didn't start reading at chapter 12. They read chapter 1 and chapter 2, and it wasn't chapters, it was a letter. So he sends a letter, and, and, and as it would, someone gets up, we got a letter from Paul. Hear ye the words of Paul. And they just read the letter. Because the people in the congregation, those who sent the letter to him, it was known, Chloe's household knew, we identified last week there were three individuals who knew. So these people are expecting a response from Paul and the response finally comes and somebody stands up and read and they don't start reading at chapter number 12. They read, explain from, from, from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 12. So when Paul begins to refer to idols, they know exactly what he's talking about. When he begins to talk about people in the spirit, so you got to understand, in these temples, people gave themselves over to demonic spirits. And they were prophesying. And they were speaking these sayings. And they would come under these spirits and they would begin to do whatever they did. And people believe. We know that in Acts, there was a Simon the sorcerer. He deceived many people. He began to do things. And then Yeshua said some things. Remember Yeshua? He says, listen. He was accused of casting out demons by the power of the devil. Remember that? Yeshua says, if I cast out demons by the power of the devil, then who do your sons cast them out by? Are you saying that, that there were people casting out demons? How? If I cast out demons by the power of the devil, then who do your sons cast? Cast these spirits out of by. Yeah. That's what he said. And we know. People saw Paul casting out spirits. And they tried to do it. And now you got individuals. Who are speaking prophetically. 
And it's not from the Almighty, it's from some spirit. So now you got to test the spirit. You're talking about test the spirit by the word. Listen, these individuals were in, the spirits were manifesting in their fellowships because these people had given themselves to demonic spirits in the temples that they worshiped in for most of their lives until they were converted to Messiah. And now they're coming into the fellowship manifesting demon spirits thinking that they are filled with the Holy Spirit. As Paul said, let me explain some things to you so that you know how to distinguish the Holy Spirit from all those other spirits. And let me give you some tests so that you can test the spirits to see if they are of Jehovah. Are you all getting this? Now, I got to lay all this out because we're going to get into every last one of these, these supernatural gifts and how they manifest in our lives and how they should be manifesting in our fellowships on a regular daily basis. You and I, if we're filled with the spirit, will manifest the gifts of the spirit. How many of you want to do that? Make sure I'm talking to the right people. So you can't be afraid of this. But you have to understand the true spirit from them other spirits so that you can recognize when the true spirit is in operation and distinguish it from these false spirits because people will say, thus said the Lord. And it's like, what? Thus said the Lord. The Lord didn't say that. How do I know he didn't say that? Because according to this verse, He didn't say that. See what I'm saying? See what I'm saying? Do you understand me, ladies and gentlemen? So we are not going to be afraid. We're going to lay this out, and then we're going to, we're not just going to step in it. Some of y'all are going to dive in it. And I'm, I'm going to invite you to dive in it because we need to, especially with where we're headed. Yeshua has already warned us, except those days be shortened. Ladies and gentlemen, there are things coming at us that you better know the spiritual gifts. You better understand discernment and, and, and how to get a word of knowledge, how to hear from Jehovah and how he will communicate to you even as you're making a decision. He'll speak to you right on the spot. Right on the spot, he'll tell you. And you got to make sure that you don't let your emotions and your feelings and your needs keep you from obeying. Because typically when the Father speaks, it's going to require some denying of self. It's typically when he calls you to do something, that means he's calling you away from something. Father in heaven, I thank you that as we're on this journey of understanding concerning things of the spirit, spiritual gifts, pray that you make it clear, so clear in fact, that we have the understanding, that we have the wisdom and knowledge and that we have the guts, the boldness to yield, to allow, to manifest the supernatural in our lives. Father, we know that we need it because the world around us, the voices that are out there, they're crying out. They're crying out to us through NBC, CNN, ABC foreign journalism. They're crying out to us on the radio, the internet. They're warning us of impending doom and disaster. 
They're telling us what we should be doing and who we should be praying for. And I know, Father, that I'm already out there. And you've, I believe, have led me. And I ask you for our protection. Because we know that everyone who stood for you in the annals of history were killed, ran out of town, beaten and left for dead. Even as they did Messiah Yeshua when they strung him up on a tree and he'd committed no crime. We've allowed religion and the world we live in to desensitize us to such a degree to where we willfully abandon your truth and exchange it for patriotism, for camaraderie, companionship, relationship, to be part of some organization, some denomination, for money, for power, for fame, for recognition, for whatever. But you've spoken to us in this hour as you've spoken to those going by to come out from among them and be separate. Then, Will you be our God and we your children? You told us to touch not the unclean thing when over 99% of the world don't seem to know what the unclean thing is. We read, there are those who read your word and they, they read it and they have no eyes to see, nor do they care because they have knowledge of what your word says and a puffy head with no application. And when we try to share with people what you say in your word, they want to beat us down, demonize us, accuse us of being in some cult, ostracize us, threaten us, talk about us, make up stuff on us. And you've called us to endure. I understand and pray now for your people that they will be bold as a lion because we live in a bold world that is freely on the newsstand and from the White House all the way to whatever house in any city state proclaiming its doctrines of abomination and acceptance. So much so to where religious institutions are buying into the doctrine of this nation. Participating in it, having ceremonies, marrying men with men and women with women, abandoning your law and teaching against it adamantly for the sake of grace and love without understanding. We know that the day is coming and now upon us where we have to stand for what is right and be willing to proclaim it even on pain of death, knowing that the opposition the retribution, the demonization will be hurled at us. Help us to stand. Help us to do all that we know to stand. To be wise with the wisdom from above. To be gentle as doves. I bless you. 
I pray your blessings upon your people. Help us to understand the warfare that we're in and why. Warfare is common among those who walk according to your spirit. Give us eyes to see that we know what we are up against and be not ignorant of the tools, the devices, the giftings, the manifestation, the weapons that you've given us to do this warfare with. I pray that you will fill your people with your spirit. Just, just lift your hands up. Pray that you will touch each of us that you'll breathe fresh life, renewed life, new life in us. Help us to not get weary in well-doing, to fight the good fight, to run our race with patience that we might finish our course. Open our eyes and our understanding, illuminate our heart, Help us to understand and to know and recognize the wiles, the schemes, the tactics that the enemy has used and is trying to use to get us to detour, to go to the left or to the right, to get off the straight and narrow. Help us to know and understand that this path that you've called us to is a narrow path and we are to walk the narrow way. Father, I pray your blessings upon every person here, every person over the internet in their various places. I pray for those who will hear these words. Raise up your people that we may stand and proclaim boldly on the rooftop those things that you revealed to us in secret and not be afraid. For you have not given us the spirit of fear. And even if we lose our lives for your sake, we shall gain it. Bless you. Bless them in Yeshua's name. For more information, visit www.arthurbaileyministries.com or call 888-899-1479. This program is made possible through financial contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.